The most precious light is the one that visits you in your darkest hour. Mehmet Murat Ildan I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. C.S. Lewis Do what is right, not what is easy, nor what is popular. Roy T. Bennett I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Jesus Good morning. Really good to see you all today. My name is Quincy, and I'm one of the uh, pastors here at the Meeting House, and we're starting a brand new series, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Um, quick question for everybody first off. Does anybody, has anybody ever slept or needed to sleep with a nightlight on? Show of hands. I won't say now, but if you've ever needed that, yeah, a couple people? All right. This is an interesting topic for me because I slept with a nightlight on for uh, longer than I care to admit. Because I, people know me, they know that I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm not good with scary things. So this is an interesting series that we'll be getting into um, the next four weeks. So you, you'll hear a lot of talk from us, uh, from our teaching series and from conversations that we're having about us turning on the lights or uh, turning over rocks is something that we'll be talking a lot about over the next couple of, of weeks. And this is an effort for us as the meeting house, as a church in this time that we're in right now to really and truly be an authentic, genuine, and vulnerable type community. We wanna have a confidence in that authenticity of realness and um, our teaching team, which is Carmen and Jimmy and I, we spent time listening to our community. We spent time listening to each other in prayer, listening to God, really trying to discern uh, what's next for uh, just the teaching portion of our ministry. And, and we've landed at this uh, small chunk of scripture at the very end of uh, Luke's uh, chapter 11 in Luke's gospel and into chapter 12. And... Um, this is a section of Jesus mostly talking. This is a section of Jesus mostly uh, teaching or mostly rebuking. Uh, this, is, this is not a fluff uh, section of scripture. Not that Jesus ever said anything that was fluff, but this is a little more tough. There's a lot of woes. There's a lot of uh, warnings. There's a lot of um, pressure. So. So I want you to, to, to buckle in and trust that Jesus will lead us as we walk through this, this chunk of scripture. Uh, for me this morning, it'll be a little bit more of just a setup. So it'll be less of an exegetical exercise and more of a, of a setup to get us ready for the weeks to come. And, and this, uh, starting in, in chapter 12, this is Jesus spending time with the people that claim to know a lot about him. A lot about God but were living in a way that was opposite of the way that they talked. They were living in a way that was very self-serving, that was more concerned with the outside look than they were on the inside look or the inside work. And we're gonna be looking at these woes and how Jesus starts to expose the hypocrisy of the people that were around him. And my prayer for us is that we would be able to allow ourselves to be not only challenged, but also encouraged. Encouraged to be the kind of church that makes a difference in the world. A church that has the confidence to let our light shine. And not because we're perfect, but because we can authentically stand in the light and not be afraid of what's to come. Because one thing that remains true and constant is that Jesus is the light of the world. And that he promises that he'll be with us forever. 
Um, I'm reminded just a number of weeks ago, uh, was Easter Sunday, we were here, and um, the question was asked to uh, Christy Penner Warden, who helped develop this Road to Hope, to ask, what has God been saying to you over the past uh, number of months? And her answer really stuck out to me. She said that God has been kind. And I, I resonate with that. In the midst of, in spite of, I feel as though God has been exceptionally kind to us. And that road to hope, which was uh, 40 days, we celebrated it over the time of Lent. It was 40 days before Easter. And if you remember, and if you don't, then that's okay. It's, on, it's all online. You can go on YouTube. Uh, every week leading up to Easter, there was a, a specific theme or word that, that actually, when we look back on it, was, uh, we call them a, a divine appointment. It was, this was uh, phrases and themes that were speaking to us really where we were as a, as a church. And that all culminated with the big celebration, the big, uh, the most important celebration of our time as Christians, and that's Easter, where we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And I'm seeing that kindness play out again as we celebrate Pentecost. Uh, Finney mentioned it earlier, Rachel mentioned it in our time of worship. But this is um, the time when the, the Holy Spirit joined us where it's, it's a lot of traditions would consider this the birthday of the church. And if you can imagine that spending every day with Jesus for three years, like his disciples would have, every day, waking and sleeping, that they, all of their time would be with Jesus. And then all of a sudden, he's captured, he's tried, he's convicted, and then he's executed. And that for that time, we, we talk about that time between Good Friday and Easter Sunday of the time of just this darkness and despair of not knowing what's coming and what's happening next. But then he ends up being raised from the dead and the excitement and the enthusiasm that would come from Jesus coming back and being with and eating with and teaching and loving and just spending time with the disciples again. So they didn't have him for those, uh, those three days where they thought all was lost. And now they get him for over a month, every day, loving and learning and laughing and being with their, their savior. And then he goes again. He goes again, but gives a promise that God would send his Holy Spirit, that God would send a special gift that would empower his followers. And the instruction was then for to wait and to pray and to watch for what God was going to do next. And I can't imagine, I don't know that we can imagine how difficult that would have been to, to have him, then he's taken away, then to have him again, and then taken away again. But then to trust that he is going to leave us everything that we need. Their leader had exited, and they were to watch and to pray and to expect something amazing to happen. Now, it's not nearly uh, under the same circumstances, but uh, we've had uh, a significant leader of ours exit. We've had two leaders in a very short order exit. And at times I feel like what it may have felt like, like the disciples did when they were in the upper room, watching and praying and waiting for something amazing to happen. And the, the Spirit does show up as the, the disciples are sitting in the upper room, Rachel read the passage, part of the passage in Acts chapter two. The spirit shows up and the church is given everything that it needs to completely turn the world upside down. And today is a reminder that this is still true. That those of us that have committed to follow Jesus have everything that we need. It's so much more than, than just a spirit force. It's a promise that God says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. By spending the spirit, not in a private religious way, but in a way that gives power to the community and builds a new family in Jesus. Pentecost for us is the reminder that everything that we need is here with us and that God is among us to bring unity, to bring reconciliation, and God's kingdom can be experienced here and now, especially through times of darkness, through times of doubt and uncertainty. If you have your Bible, 
Uh, let's open it to uh, Luke's Gospel in chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 33. 33 to 36. Jesus says these words, No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body, and when your eyes are good, your whole body also is full of light. But when they are bad, your body also is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be completely lighted, it will be completely lighted as when the light of a lamp shines on you. Jesus, before he shares these words, had finished teaching his disciples how to pray. Uh, he had cast out a demon, and after casting out the demon, he's immediately accused of having a demon himself. And he ends up rebuking the people around for always asking him to show a miraculous sign, to prove to them that he really is who he said he is. And in this passage this morning, Jesus is talking about the contrast between light and dark. And the contrast is, is very simple to understand. It's not a difficult concept for us. We know that the light is good and the dark is bad, right? The dark is, is unpredictable. The dark is a place where we lose a degree of our agency or our control or our ability to have a say in our lives. The dark is a place that seems unsafe. Um, for me, when I was a kid, uh, it's a little scary, scary place. Um, a number of years ago, um, I went with my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time. But I went with my wife to go visit her sister down in Niagara Falls. We were going down there for a couple of days, and we were looking for something fun to do. And um, not only do I, am I sometimes scared. Okay, this is... Uh, Confession time. I'm also, I'm also very cheap. So um, anytime, anytime that I'm looking to go and do something, I'm looking for a coupon to find first. So we're in Niagara Falls. I'm looking for something, some way to enjoy our time that's not going to cost a lot of money. And I found coupons for this haunted house that was in the area. And I thought, oh, this will be fun. It's two for one. And um, I had fond memories from when I was a kid. And you go into this thing and it had like a wacky, wacky mirrors and a funny floor and like an old beat up animatronic uh, Frankenstein. I thought, this is fun. It's, it's a silly time, right? It's great. So we get the tickets and we go and we show up at this place. And I was not getting uh, funny, silly vibes when I walked up. But um, I had already purchased the ticket, so we were there. And then they start kind of reading us the, the rules, right, of how to engage in this. And I said, well... Um, you're going to, you may experience something and you may be inclined to like punch or hit or, or kick someone. And I thought, oh, okay, this is not good. And, and they keep going and giving this. And if, and if it becomes too much for you to bear, just scream out the name of, of the, you know, the attraction that we were at and then we'll turn on all the lights and then we'll escort you out. And then, and then as you're being escorted out, we just have to let you know that we'll take your picture and then your picture will go on this wall of shame. And I thought, oh, wonderful. This sounds, this sounds like a terrible idea. And I don't understand why people do this to themselves, but they do this anyway. Um, so, so we go in, and the last thing they say to us before they close the door is they said, just follow the light. So, okay, great. And then they close the door, and they shut the lights out. And they shut, when I say they shut the lights out, they shut the lights out. Right away, immediately, I take my hand and I put my hand like this to my face to see, and I can't see anything. And you, you know, and it's like if I open my eyes wider, then somehow it'll become more clear. My eyes are bugged out in my head. I'm looking, and I don't see a light. And until I, I faintly in the distance, I see a small little pin light. It's almost like the light on a, uh, like a um, smoke detector, right? It's just this little small beam of light. And because it's so dark, I can't tell if it's like 10 feet away or if it's a mile away. I have no point of reference. So then we start walking. We, go, we start walking uh, in the direction to this light. And the idea is that every once in a while, the lights will come on and it will expose whatever thing is there to, to, to scare you. I was so scared. The lights came on 
And this big, grown, brave man, I had crouched down. I was like this, and I had my, my wife was like this. I had, her, I had her pushed against my chest, and my sister, I grabbed with the other arm, and I had done like this as we're walking, and I'm getting myself as low as I can. So when the lights come on, I realize in that moment, and I'm exposed for everyone, that this big, grown man is playing coward in the mix. I'm cowering behind my... my petite, little, uh, barely five foot tall wife who's supposed to protect me from the boogeyman. And the lights come on and I realize in that moment that it was just some guy with a silly rubber mask and I'm in a set that's just, I don't probably had put together by some art student that was like trying to figure out, like get some some extra credit or something. It It wasn't that impressive. And I realized, well, I was shamed, first of all, uh, embarrassed by being exposed like that. But then I, I, I was reminded of, you know, earlier trauma of being afraid when I was a kid, but it was just this idea that I was more afraid of what I wasn't able to see. My imagination running away from me, the what if, what is there, what could happen to me. I was unable to predict what was going to happen next. I was unable to understand or have control over anything. And in that situation, in the dark, I was stumbling. We will stumble when we sit in the dark. We question what's real. We question question what is true. What can be trusted? Who can be trusted? But with the lights on, when the lights come on, we get to see things for what they really are. So that light has a way of revealing the truth and there's nothing to be afraid of. More light is needed in order for us to see any situation for what it really is. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, I'm also proud to say that we're, as a leadership team, as your pastors, as your leaders are making that commitment to lead in a way that's in the light, that's not uh, in the shadows or trying to hide anything. And Jesus says in verse 33 uh, of this passage, as well as in the Sermon on the Mount, that a light does not get put under a bushel. And if we as a church and we as individuals are getting this right, we become the kind of people that people want to see. And not in a way that you kind of gawk and point fingers and make fun of, but in a kind of way that inspires and encourages people to practice a life of joy, of love, of peace, of kindness, of goodness. I think um, when I hear this, phrase of let your light shine or don't hide your light. I think I've always thought of this as an invitation to be a kind of spiritual superstar. Like in order to be your light or to have your light shine, you have to, you have to be uh, as close to perfection as possible. But what if your stuff isn't perfect? What if it isn't all put together? What if it's not all polished and you're not sitting pretty? What if part of the light that is shining is a light that has a hallmark of authenticity and vulnerability? What if being a light on a hill is less about being perfect and more about living with a disposition towards honesty, a place of, that emphasizes reconciliation, truth, and peace? A light shining is about being a witness to what following Jesus can look like, especially when things aren't good and shiny. Or how the rest of this passage indicates that is living with simplicity, undistracted and with generosity. So I'll I'll explain. Jesus says uh, that the eye is a lamp of the body. And if the eye is good, your whole body is good. And if the eye is bad, the whole body is bad. And this makes sense to us, right? If you can't see, it's difficult, um, difficult to navigate. But to the Jewish context, the Jewish mind is talking about a perspective that is not self-serving and not generous. So to have a good eye for the Jew is one that sees opportunities to serve and love others and to not be distracted. A good eye is an eye that is simple. A good eye is secure. It is sincere. And looking for opportunities to help others and partner with others to come alongside with others that are in need. It's when we have the lights on is when we're able to see each other. 
And that's great. Light is good, darkness is bad, right? Simple, we've got that easy concept to understand. So then why is it that we are so often drawn to the darkness? Eugene Peterson in the message puts it this way, uh, John chapter three, uh, verses 19 to 21. He says, this is the crisis that we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the God work that it is. The dark actually hides us and can feel like it's protecting us, protecting us from feeling shame, from feeling con condemnation, from feeling judgment, especially if we have things that we're afraid to be found out. So what would happen if all the lights got turned on in our own lives? All the moral failure that I've been seeing over the past little while um, creates the temptation in me to do finger pointing. I say, I'm so glad I'm not as bad as that person or I've never been wrapped up in something like this. But what if it's an opportunity for us to acknowledge our own stuff? This is really, really, really hard work to do but it's incredible to watch the freedom that comes from the turning on the lights, and not just on the outside, but that self-examining inner work. I believe that we will discover over the next number of weeks, even as, as early as this coming Tuesday, where we have our community gathering, that as a community that brings things to light and ex exposing is not, not about God's judgment or shame, but it's about his restorative invitation. The, the light of Jesus is not meant to humiliate, but meant to illuminate. It's the best way in which we can see what is going on around us and bring us to healing and to freedom. I've had a number of conversations with people over the last number of months uh, some good, some uh, ch more challenging. But the conversations that I've been really encouraged by are people that are saying, no, um, in spite of all the things that are going on, we want to lean in even further into our church, this place that we call home. And I want to say thank you for your courage and your, your boldness to say, this is my, my home, these are my people as I'm encouraged in a real way that we're going to see God do some things that we couldn't script, we couldn't imagine. Maybe now we can, can we turn the lights on now? Can we turn them up? I remember my wife and I, oh yes, there you are, I see you. My wife and I, we came here years ago, we were on the verge of uh, ministry burnout. And one of the things that we loved about this place in particular was that we could come in, we could hide in, in the dark, no one would see us, we didn't have to talk to nobody, you don't have to pray to nobody, you don't have to stack a chair, you don't have to, we just come and get a good spiritual meal and then go out the back door and it was great for our time, for our season. But I'm, and I've talked to many people who that was, that was their experience where this place was a place of healing a place of regeneration, of refreshing, of like, this is, a good, this is a good place for us to be right now. And I think that's still the case, but I, I, think, I think the way that we do things are gonna be a little bit different, where this is less about a place where we come and we hide and get a good meal and we go out, but instead we, we see one another and we trust one another and we build one another up, encourage one another to good works, that we can do this work together of shining our light. As a dad, one of my, um, my new roles, and I don't even know how it happens, but you just kind of inherit these roles once you become a dad, is that I'm like the light police in my home. So 
anybody who like controls or has to pay any utility bills understands what I'm talking about. You just go around and you shut all the lights off. Anytime it's like, why is this light on? Why is this fridge off? Why is it constantly turning lights off? I don't know why, I don't know when it happened to me when I become like, I don't know. Anyway, that's what I'm doing. And I'm constantly turning, turning lights off. Except when it's time to clean the house. When the kids are doing their dishes, when, they're time, when it's time to get into the corners, that's the one time when I'm like, no, we turn all the lights on in the spot. Because if we're going to do the work, we need to be able to see clearly to get into the corners and to, and to do a proper job of getting things right. And I feel as though that this is, a, this is a time that we're in right now. I don't know how long this time will be for us, but this is a time for us now to turn the lights on. It's so wonderful to see you. This is great. You're beautiful people. But that we can do this together. We can shoulder this work that we have, that we get to do. Let me close uh, with this um, quote from N.T. Wright. When you see the dawn breaking, you think back to the darkness in a new way. Sin is not simply the breaking of a law. It is the missing of an opportunity. Having heard the echoes of a voice, we are called to come and meet the speaker. We are invited to be transformed by the voice itself. The word of the gospel, the word which declares that evil has been judged, that the world has been put to it, put to rights, that heaven and earth are joined forever and that new creation has begun. We are called to become people who can speak and live and paint and sing that word so that those who have heard its echoes can come and lend a hand in a larger project. That is the opportunity that stands before us as a gift and a possibility. Christian holiness is not, as people often imagine, a matter of denying something good. It is about growing up and grasping something that's even better. My prayer is that we would be a brave and courageous people. That we face our fears that lurk in the shadows and that, that face the fear of being exposed. And that we can be in a group of imperfect people and let our imperfect love for Jesus shine bright on a hill for the whole world to see. Let's pray. Father, you have said that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we give thanks that you have given us every single thing that we need to shine bright, to, work, to turn this world upside down, and to show others what it looks like to be a transformed people in the light of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.